What version am I reading out of here? I'm glad you brought your Bible to church. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. <laughs> Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Another translation may make it a little more sensible. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be filled with anxiety. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. There's that word mind again. Will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think, there's your mind again, think. On these things. Those things which you have both learned and received. And heard and seen. In me. Do it. And the God of peace. Shall be with you. That's a powerful word, isn't it? A powerful word. Let's bow our hearts and pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for the reading of the Holy Scriptures. And I pray that the anointing of God will mantle every soul in divine presence. Captivate our thoughts tonight and let them be centered on you, Jesus. Let these lips be touched with a coal from off the altar of God. Let them speak, these lips of clay, let them speak as the oracles of God. Hide your servant behind that cross and let them see no man save Jesus. Minister to the need of every heart. Don't allow one person to leave this place disappointed. But let them leave tonight singing a new song that I got just what I wanted from the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody shouted amen. Yeah. And amen. I read these first nine verses for a purpose. And if I'm going to put a title on this message, I'm going to title it Victory Over Circumstances. There's a thief out there that controls this world. He is an enemy. A common enemy to every one of us. Your enemy is not the boss that you work for. Your enemy is not your husband or your wife. Your enemy is not your pastor. And God knows your enemy is not the evangelist. 
But your enemy is the devil. He is a thief that goes about trying to steal and to kill and to destroy. And some of you have had the hand of the enemy on your life. Many of you that are watching by television, your back is against the wall and there's no way out. Many of you are pulling your hair out. How can I get out of this mess? I have tried everything. To no avail. There is no way out. In this particular fourth chapter, I believe that the apostle here is trying to let us know that we can have a mind that is secure. The mind is the battleground. This is where the devil is attempts to defeat you. You may never meet him head on, but you will meet him in your mind. Your temptations come to you, first of all, through the mind. That's why Paul says to renew your mind. Put on the mind of Christ. He will keep your hearts and your mind. He will give you peace. Be anxious for nothing. In other words, let me put it in language that we can understand. You as a child of God, stop worrying. (laughs) Worry will drive you insane. How am I going to pay the rent? How are we going to put food on the table? What am I going to wear? Jesus talks about this while he was on the shores of Galilee when he preached not only to his disciples, but when he preached, it was recorded in Holy Writ and the message is to you and to me. Worry. I see people in the prayer line biting their nails to their wrist. I talked to some. I've had so-and-so pray for me and I didn't get any better. And I I, I wonder if I'm going to get it now. Stop worrying. You won't get it. Your problem is not the sickness Your problem is the worry. And if you are are plagued with this dreaded disease tonight, I am going to set you free and destroy that yoke that causes you to be filled with anxiety that causes you to worry about everything. You're afraid to go to sleep. You're afraid you may not wake up. Then when it's time to wake up, you're afraid to get up. I don't know whether I'm going to make it through the day. You worry about falling in love. I don't know whether God wants me to be happy or not. And then when you fall in love, I wonder how long it's going to last. I wonder if she'll marry me. What if she says no? And when she says yes, you wish she'd have said no. Worry! No matter what you do, worry is there. Did I make the right move? Should I take this job? You know what I'm talking about. Now, I look this word up, Brother Webster. You know what he says? Worry means to be pulled in different directions. Have you ever been there? Let me see your hand, if you've ever been there. If your hand ain't up, now don't compound it by lying. We've all had a nap out of this bag. To be pulled in different directions. And another definition is to strangle. And that's all that devil has to do is to get you to worry. Pastors, you're not immune from this either. 
Did God call me to this city? Shall I rent this building? Will we pay the rent? Will the people pay their tithes? Should I build a new church? Will they get mad at me and leave? Worry, worry. Half of our life is filled with worry. And it's nothing but an instrument of the devil to keep you from the peace of God. Jesus said, ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Aren't you glad you have his words? Do you know when you worry, I talk, Dr. Cherry is a dear friend of mine. And Dr. Cherry tells me that the majority of sicknesses today come from worry. And here we get in the prayer line and ask for prayer and we rebuke sicknesses and the symptoms go, but they come back. Why? Because you're still worrying. I believe if we come at that devil at a different angle tonight and let's get at the worry and destroy the worry and make sure we have peace and find peace of mind, then we will know how to be healed of those symptoms that come physically. (laughs) High blood pressure, the physical consequences that come from worry is high blood pressure, low blood pressure. Headaches, neck trouble. Oh, I got all, I had a 12 year old boy come. I said, What's your problem? Ulcers. I said, What are you worrying about? (laughs) Ulcers, 12 years of age. Most of the cases of ulcers men have and women have because they worry. These are the physical consequences that stem from this. And Paul is writing to the church at Philippi and he says, Be anxious for nothing. Don't let anything upset you. Don't worry. You're a child of God. Now from the spiritual point of view, worry is wrong thinking. That's the only way I can put it. In the spiritual point of view, worry is wrong thinking. That has to do with your mind. And have you ever said, I I don't feel good? Your feeling has to do with the heart. The mind and the heart that are connected together. You know what worry is? I have a little definition of worry. Worry is the interest you pay on trouble that's coming your way. That's a pretty good definition. Worry is the interest that you pay on the trouble you don't have yet, but it's coming. Why? Because you are worrying about it. Will it happen to me? And here the apostle is showing us a way out how we can correct the condition of the mind and think properly. Putting on the mind of Christ and he tells us what we should think on. Hallelujah. Has the devil ever told you you're never going to get well? You have what your father had. It's hereditary. It's in my genes. When I found out, I I threw away my genes. But you see, you are a child of God now. You are born again. You have a new father. Are you listening to me? Now you are obedient unto his voice. And he says, from now on, when you're obedient to me, I'll bless you going in. And I'll bless you when you come out. I'll bless your basket. I'll bless your store. I'll bless you in the city. I'll bless you in the country. 
shall make you the head and not the tail. You shall lend and not borrow. And whatever you set your hands to, I will bless it. My God, you don't have to worry. All you got to do is be obedient unto his voice. And you are blessed. And you are blessed. And you are blessed. I dare you to turn around and look at three people and tell them, I'm blessed. <laughs> Shout it out loud. I'm blessed. <laughs> now the first thing I want to deal with here is that first, is that verse in verse number four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. That doesn't mean rejoice when revival comes to town. That doesn't mean rejoice when you go to church, when the church door is open. But Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. When you get up in the morning, rejoice. When you go through the day, rejoice. Hallelujah. I'm talking about rejoicing in the Lord. You don't have to sing to the syncopated sound of a ham and organ or the beat of a tambourine. But God can give you joy all by yourself. You can make music to God because he lives in you. Can you raise your hands and shout amen? amen. Rejoice. The church has become a poor advertisement for Christ. They don't look a bit happy. If they would smile, their face would crack. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The devil's out to steal your joy. You ought to come into church shouting. You ought to go to church praising the Lord. Don't wait till you get in the song service. But when you get out of that automobile, you ought to rejoice in the Lord always. He said, again, I say rejoice. I tell you, that devil don't like you rejoicing. He don't like that noise. I had a woman come to me and she said, Brother Shamrock, you don't have to make all that noise. God ain't deaf. I said, he ain't nervous either, honey. And I said, I've got something to shout about. I'm the one that was lost. I was one on my way to hell. My sin separated me from God. But thank God, he found my hiding place. He died for me on Calvary. He washed my sins away. He picked me up out of the miry clay. He took a stony heart out of me and put in a heart of flesh, clothed me with his righteousness, and wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life, and I can rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Most of the time in our churches, we sit there like a bunch of warts on pickles. I mean, there's no response. Everybody looks dead. I'm not talking about your church now. I'm talking about some churches. I mean, you can hear the mice walk in the rafters of the church. Everything is so quiet. That man with that long robe comes up and stands behind the pulpit. Dearly beloved. No wonder everybody's dead. The icicle's dead behind the pulpit. We need a revival in the church. Shout amen with me. Rejoice. Rejoice in the law. But you see, we've all been to the, to the seminaries. I mean the cemeteries. But I was right the first time. And we've learned homiletics. We've learned how to preach. An introduction to the message. Three points. And a conclusion. And then everybody sings the doxology and goes home. And we even have it related. On our notes. When to step aside. 
for a 10 second break to break the monotony and then get back. Preach for 10 minutes more and come out to the left. Then the preacher says, everybody say amen. Amen. <laughs> Nobody makes noise until he orchestrates it from the pulpit. Are you listening to me? Yeah. I'm talking about going to church, praising God and rejoicing in your spirit. That church is not a filling station like you go to fill up your gas tank, but you go to church filled up and you are running over that everybody gets together. We are rejoicing in the Lord and we're there to worship Him and to praise Him. Raise your hands and rejoice and shout praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Glory. Worry, hear it, worry cancels out joy. Just think about that a moment. Sometimes when you go to church and you're not shouting, you're not praising the Lord. That's because something's bothering you. What's going to happen tomorrow? I'm worrying. Oh, what am I going to do? I got this ticket for speeding. I was supposed to have been there yesterday. And I missed it. What am I going to do? Everybody's shouting but you. Worry cancels out joy. You see the, see the head trip the devil's putting you on? Putting thoughts in your mind to worry? Listen, all things work together for good to them to love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. No matter what comes before you, don't let that devil put a head trip on you. God's got everything under control. He's still at the throne of the universe. He's your heavenly father. He knows you have need of all things and he will provide. He is still Jehovah Jireh. Raise your hands and shout amen with me. Worry will cancel out that joy. And I could spend all night on that, but I don't want to. But I'll never forget the story I heard of a, of a man who just graduated from his seminary. He got his Ph.D. and his D.D. and he got assigned to his first church. I'll never forget this. When he got there, the church was a little lively, but he was kind of dead. And he told the people, he said, now that I'm your new pastor, we're going to do things different around here now. From now on, there'll be no more shouting. We're going to do things in, in order. And it's going to be a quietness. He said, I want you to follow my lead. He said, I've graduated from the seminary and I've been educated, and we're going to do things in order, and we're going to do away with this noise. And it took him about six months to get it all toned down, he thought. He never even bothered to write his sermons out because some of the people were still shouting. But after six months, he had everything under control, and he got it the way he wanted it. It was dead. I mean, quiet. And finally, he worked on his message all week long, had it all typewritten out on 15 pages, double spaced, had his inflections already typed in, had everything perfect, and now he is going to demonstrate his educational prowess. A man that has been educated with a DD and a PhD. And now he's going to stand before his congregation and he's going to wax eloquent and let them know they have an educated preacher, a uh, minister. He got into his message that he was reading 
And he got to page five, and halfway through it, while he was reading, there was an old-fashioned deacon in the back that left out one of them great big old, Well, glory! And that was like an atom bomb that struck. And he became frustrated, and all 15 pages of notes fell down to the ground, and he lost his place. He was never so humiliated in all of his life. He could not finish his sermon. And the only thing he could do was stop them and pray and put the benediction on them. And he became so aggravated at that brother at the back for making that noise. He said, now, I don't know what it was that I said that made him shout. <laughs> but he said, I'm going to go visit him in the morning. And I'm going to find out what it was I said. And whatever it was that I said, I'm going to cut it out of my mind. And I'll never say it again. So he won't shout. Monday morning, he headed out. This brother, Deacon, he was a farmer. And he had two mules out there. And he was plowing up a field. And the preacher hurdled that fence and he didn't even bother going to the house. This was no pastoral call. This was a man-to-man -man talk. And he went right out in the middle of that field. And when the farmer saw him, he hauled on them mules, or woed on them mules, brought them to a stop. And he said, oh, brother pastor, let's go inside. And he said, have a cup of coffee. He said, no, sir, this ain't no pastoral call. He said, I'll come out here and talk to you man to man, sir. All right, let's talk, sir. He said, do you remember when I first came to this church, I told you we were going to do things in order and we were going to make some changes. He said, yes, sir, I do remember that. Do you remember I said, nobody was going to make any more noise. He said, yes, sir, I do remember that. Well, he said, yesterday in the middle of my sermon, you embarrassed me. I was humiliated. He said, I only got halfway through my sermon. And he said, I lost my place because you left out a great big old yell and shouted. And I said, I want you to be honest with me, brother. What was it that I said that made you shout? But whatever it was, I ain't going to say it no more. He thought for a minute and put his foot up on that cross piece of that plow. He said, Brother Pastor, let you and I get one thing straight. You've been here six months. Ain't nothing you ever said made me shout. <laughs> nothing at all. But he said, when I get to thinking how steeped I was in sin, when Jesus reached down with his strong right hand and picked me up, and washed me in his blood, and took out a stony heart and put in a heart of flesh, and wrote my name in the Lamb's book of mm, life. Hallelujah. He said, when I get to thinking what, ah, what he's done for me. He said, I can't help. Ah, I got to shout, man. He said, I just don't shout in church, preacher. Here, hold my mules. I feel another shout coming on right out here in the field. I'm talking about rejoicing in the Lord. Everybody wanted me to tone it down when I come on television. I am. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. When do we get to heaven? We really gonna have church. Hallelujah. This is only warm up time. We're rejoicing in the middle of all this hell. Why? Because Jesus is here and we have something to rejoice.
Ahí sí. Why worry when I can rejoice? Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Why? Listen. But in everything, by prayer. There it is. You don't have to worry. Peter had the sentence of death on him. They're going to cut his head off. They already killed James with a sword. Now Peter was in prison. He's found guilty. The sentence of death is on him. Four quaternions of soldiers are around him. He's going to die in the morning and he is asleep. Now if you knew you were going to die in the morning, you wouldn't be asleep. You'd be up pacing that floor. Oh Lord, look at the mess you got us into. You'd be blaming God on this thing. If I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't be in here. Now, Peter, he was snoring up a rug. Sound asleep. Why? Here it is. Prayer was made unto God of the church for Peter. There's something about prayer. You don't have to worry. You can pray. Oh, Lord, I feel good about this. Now, I, I sort of, that's just my introduction now. I'm getting into three points here. <laughs> and let me give them to you in case I don't get through with them. But if you want to get in, how many of us would like to get to a place where you don't have to worry no more? I, I believe anybody in their right mind would want to get there. Isn't that true? A place where you don't have to worry as a child of God. Write these th three things down. I find them right in here. You've got to learn how to pray right. Then you've got to learn how to think right. And then after you get them two things together, then you've got to learn how to live right. And then when you live right, my God, you're as free as you can be. You don't have to worry about anything. Can you shout amen, somebody? Pray right. Think right. And live right. And the devil will never have a weapon that will prosper against you. Because you have somebody that's by your side that will never leave you nor forsake you even to the end of the age. Can you raise your hands and shout amen with me? Now let's go back with this. Verse number 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything. Listen, by prayer. And supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If we learn how to pray right. Now do you notice there's three things he talks about. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Now, I want you to turn back to the book of Daniel, because when you talk about praying right, you can't leave Daniel out of this. Daniel is a man of God that knew how to pray, and in that sixth chapter of Daniel, look at verse 11, let me read it to you. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day when it was against the law to pray. Now listen. He knelt three times a day here and prayed, number one, Gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication, number three, before his God. There's the three ingredients. Prayer, thanksgiving, and supplication. Now you hear me, church. Don't you turn that television set off. Keep it on. 
most of us in the church don't know how to pray. All we know about prayer is, Lord, heal me. Lord, deliver me. I need $84.50, Lord, send it. Western Union. Lord, give me. How come y'all ain't shouting now? That's the only way we know how to pray. We treat God like Santa Claus. Even before you go to bed at night. Lord, bless me. Bless my wife. Bless my daughter. Bless my son. Bless us four. No more. <laughs> Good night, Lord. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Most of the time, we don't even bother to get on our knees. We lay before the Lord. Now, if you can't shout amen, holler ouch. And I know you're out there. But there's something about these ingredients that Paul's talking about. He's talking about adoration. When you come into the presence of God, He is your heavenly Father. He's the one that created the universe. He's the one that put the stars in place. He hung the sun and the moon. And when you come into His presence, we adore Him. We love you, Jesus. We adore you, Lord. We're offering adoration and worship and praise to our God. He belongs to me. And He said, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. Ooh -wee. In other words, learn how to thank him for it before you get it. Oh, hallelujah. When the prayer is offered and the man of God or the woman of God lays hands on you and makes your request known to God, throw them hands up and say, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. I've got it. Devil, you are a liar. I praise God for giving me the answer. Hallelujah. I'm going to rejoice. This is prayer. Supplication. Jesus cleansed ten lepers but only one came back one out of ten and that's approximately what it is today one out of ten one man came back to give him what thanksgiving that's the word he gave him thanksgiving because he was thankful Jesus said where are the nine where there are not ten cleansed. When God does something for you, He expects thanksgiving. I'll never forget a woman. I believe I told this, but it'll bear repeating. A lady that walked into my meeting. I won't tell the whole story, but she was had a dispossess in her hand. And she was about to be put out in the streets because she was four months behind on her rent. And she came into that service on a Sunday night, 10 o'clock Monday morning. They're going to put her out on the street. She had a mother that was blind for 50, no, not 50, about 30, 37, 38 years. The time element's not material to it anyway. But she was totally blind for 30-some years. And she was in the service that night. And I laid down everything and I preached to that woman and I pumped her full of faith. She had half of her goods moved to her brother's house. She was already on the verge of being put out in her mind, she was already moved. She came for help. That night I laid hands on her blind mother first. I rebuked, rebuked, I rebuked a blind spirit and commanded it come out of her. God did not instantly heal her eyes. But in my spirit, I knew she was healed.
I knew. I looked at her and I said, Mama, will you do me a favor? She said, anything you tell me to do, preacher, I will do it. I said, the whole way home tonight, I want you to thank God for giving you perfect eyesight. She said, I'll do it. I put an usher on either side of her. She was blind as a bat. They led her out. And while she was moving, she said, devil, use a liar. I'm healed by his stripes. Lord, I thank you for perfect vision. Praise God. I'm not blind, but I can see. The man of God prayed for me, and you always answer prayer. In the morning, she was awakened with a smell of coffee, bacon cooking, eggs frying, biscuits in the oven. And she sat up in her bed and looked over in her blind mama's bed, and the bed was empty. She was making her mother breakfast for 30 some years. She quick threw on a robe and ran out into the kitchen and there was her mama making breakfast. She said, what are you doing, mama? She said, brother Shambach told me if I praise God the whole way home, I'd wake up with perfect vision. She said, honey, I can see for the first time in 38 years, Jesus Christ healed me. You know what they did? They shouted in the kitchen. And she wasn't put out on no street. But she didn't. She said, we didn't eat no breakfast. I put that dispossess on the table. And I said, Lord, if you can open mama's eyes, you can pay the rent. you got two hours yet. Take your time. <laughs> Woo, that's running it close. Can you shout praise the Lord? Maybe rejoice. I want you to know God had a woman call her on the phone. A woman that borrowed money from her. 15 or 20 years ago and God saved her the night before and told her to pay back what she borrowed from that woman and give her 6% interest. She come to that church that night, put $200 in my hand and said, Brother Shambach, God blessed me with $2,000. My rent, back rent was paid. I gave him four months in advance and the constable tore up the dispossessed. I don't have to worry no more. Why? Because I learned how to pray. I learned how to thank God. I learned how to give him praise. And he gave me the answer. I said, pray right. Yeah. Look at verse 8. I can spend all night on each one of these points. It's not enough just to pray right. You've got to change your way of thinking. Oh, I wonder what's going to happen to me. So what? Sudden death, sudden glory. <laughs> You'd be surprised. People come in here. They say, Brother Shambach, please, will you pray for my mama? Pray for her now. I said, no, I want her to hear me preach. Well, she knows all about that. I said, well, then why ain't she well? If she knows all about it. Get her, I want her to listen to me preach. She said, well, she's going to die. I said, then we'll raise her from the dead. Sit her down there. I, I ain't worried about this thing. We're serving a God that's able to do anything. Can you shout amen? You need to hear the word of God being preached. You've got to change your thinking. Peace involves your heart and your mind. Turn back to me with 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10. Listen. Verse number 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what you call changing your mind. Why? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now here's the answer. Finally, brethren, in verse 8. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, think on these things. Let all the other junk go by. Leave the bad reports alone, but think on the good report. If you got a bad report from the doctor, get the good report from the Word of God that says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. The devil is a liar. God's going to make a way. This is my night for a miracle. I don't care what the devil may say. God's going to turn it around and he's going to give me my miracle. Raise your hands and shout amen. With me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn back to the Psalms with me. I'm going to read something else. The 19th Psalm. Oh, I love this. 
There's nothing that you can fill your mind with more than the Word of God. Psalm 19, verse 7, 8, and 9. Listen, the law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. My God, you can preach that thing laying down, Bert. Amen. Are you listening to me? And over in the 119th Psalm, verse number 9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Verse meditation all the day. Verse 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Talking about the word of God. Think, I said think on these things. Pray right, think right, and now live right. And with this I close. Look at verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received, mind and heart. You learn it through the mind, you receive it in the heart. You heard the mind, what you hear with the ear, you get it through the mind. What you've heard and seen in me And the God of peace shall be with you. You hear me now. Sin results in unrest. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's why we need to change our way of living. We don't live according to the dictates that comes from the pulpit, but we live according to the dictates of the Word of God. There are some preachers that will tell you something that is altogether contrary to the Word of God. Let every man and let every devil be a liar, but let God be true. When the Holy Spirit controls the mind, you have truth. When the devil controls the mind, 
There's nothing but lies. Are you listening to me? Paul said, what you have learned and received and what you heard and seen in me. In other words, I didn't come just to preach it, but you saw me live it. You know what manner of men we were in your presence. Oh, hallelujah. Are you listening to me? Some preachers say, don't do as I do, but do as I say. But your actions speak louder than words. Paul says, you were an example of me. And when I made it work effectively in me, you made it work effectively in you. Because you are a doer of the word. And not just a hearer only. Listen, with this I close. The sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel. I love these words of Jesus. He said, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Why worry? Can I go on and read a little more? Look at verse 28. Why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Take no thought. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? After all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Here it is now. Here's the key. But seek ye first. Here's the bottom line. This is no blessing plan. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these things shall be added unto you. My right, God, you ought to be dancing in the aisles by now. And in the seventh chapter, he sums it up and says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. What man is there of you whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? But you got to be on asking ground. you got to be on believing ground. You are a child of God. You are obedient unto his voice. Then all of these things shall be added unto you. You've learned how to change your way of praying. You've learned how to change your way of thinking. And now you're living according to the concept of God's eternal word. You are his child. And he said, everyone that asketh, receive it. You can't get any richer in what I'm talking about here now. But if you're not saved, then you've got to play the lottery. And you got to take your chances with the lottery. If you're not saved, then you got to play bingo and hope that you win the big thousand dollar pot. Or you'll fill out Ed, Mc, Ed McMahon's, you may be a ten million dollar winner. But if you're a child of God, you can throw that all in the trash and have a clean mind. And God said, I'll bless you. Every place that the soles of your feet you shall tread upon, you shall 
possess it. Hallelujah. I'm a child of God. I'm blessed. I'm the richest man in Phoenix, but I can't change a quarter. Are you listening to me? I'm talking about being rich, folks. Being in the will of God. Doing what He commands me to do. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you're in trouble. But you can correct that tonight. You hold the key in your decision. You mark this down. God sends nobody to hell. You send yourself by rejecting your only cure. You hold your own destiny in your decision. You either choose to accept Christ or you choose to reject him. I come to tell you Muhammad's not the way. Buddha is not the way. Transcendental meditation is not the way. Hare Krishna is not the way. Mr. Moon is not the way. You got to get higher than the moon. You got to get to the sun. Jesus said, The truth and the light. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. He's the only way. Thank you for watching Voice of Power. If you'd like to write to Dr. Shambach, the address is R.W. Shambach, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and your contributions. Glory to God. Isn't it wonderful to be on the front row where God is moving mightily by His Spirit? And just to think you can sit there in your home or lie there in your bed and participate in an old-fashioned Holy Ghost miracle revival. Thank God for 24-hour Christian television. Thank God for Trinity Broadcast Network. Thank God for Paul and Jan Crouch. They make it possible. And your love gifts is what keeps it coming into your home. I want to thank you personally for allowing me the pleasure and the privilege of being in your home with you and your family. And I trust it's a blessing to you. Why don't you drop Paul and Jan a letter and just pour your heart out to them. Let them know how much you do enjoy that. Will you do that and close a love gift? Now, you know, there's nothing like being in a live uh, Holy Ghost revival meeting. And if you need any additional information about our ministry at all, about our tapes, our books, our records, if you have any prayer requests you want me to pray over, write me at my home office. That's R.W. Shambog, Tyler, Texas. The zip code is 75711. That's all the address you need. I appreciate you as a friend, and if we can be of help to you, it would be my pleasure to help you. The mailing address, once again, is R.W. Shambo, Tyler, Texas, 75711. When you write, request our list of services where we're going to be. We may be in your area in the near future. And that way you can keep in touch with me because there's nothing like being a live service. Thank you so much for allowing me the pleasure of spending this hour with you. This is Brother Shambach reminding all of my friends everywhere, you don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. This is TBN, the Trinity Broadcasting Network.